Welcome to Worship with Trinity Reformed Church. We are a community God gathers, transforms, and sends to share Christ's expansive love with the world. If you're new to Trinity this morning, we'd love to connect with you and share a little bit about what's happening in our life together. If you are here in the sanctuary, we invite you to fill out a welcome card. You can find those in the Bibles by your seats, or if you're online, you can just shoot us an email and we can connect. We have a few announcements in the, our life together that I want to highlight for you this morning. A few are options for today to engage after worship with your Trinity family. The first option is during second hour. We're going to be exploring this morning together the places that we experienced light in the midst of the darkness of the pandemic. So the Old Hoffs are going to be sharing some of their experiences with us, and then we're all going to have a chance to share those blessings that we experienced in the midst of the pandemic, as well as to celebrate the ways we were able at Trinity to be the church together during that time. <coughs> and then we have a couple extra things happening this afternoon. Everybody is invited to an intergenerational game of ultimate Frisbee this afternoon at 2 p.m. at Sweet Street Park. Again, all ages, all skill levels are welcome to attend and participate. And then there's also the annual pumpkin carving party this afternoon. It's going to be at Ben and I's house um, rather than at the Caterbergs this year. And again, that's for anybody who'd like to come, all ages. Uh, if you'd like, you can bring a pumpkin to carve. If you'd like, you can bring some food to share. If you'd like, you can wear a costume, but none of those things are required. We'd love to have you join us this afternoon at our house at four o'clock. And then next Sunday too is filled <laughs> with opportunities. Um, more on Sunday morning that we just wanna remind you about this week so you can be ready. Children and children at heart next week on October 31st are invited to wear their costumes for worship. Miss Kate is very excited. I'm very excited to see her costume. Um, and then the kids during second hour are gonna be having a special Halloween -y celebration and Adults are invited to join us here in the sanctuary for second hour next week. We're going to be doing um, a class, a conversation around worshiping with young children in the sanctuary. It's both intended for folks who are parents of young children, but also for all of us, because we all worship with young children in our sanctuary. So we're going to be talking about the gifts and challenges and how to do that well together. So you can join, plan on that next week. The last thing, we are experiencing our typical fall boiler hiccups. So the boiler for this building is doing great. As you can tell, we're all nice and comfy. The boiler for the other part of the building is not doing as well today. So especially for children who are gonna be over there for children in worship or for second hour, if you brought a jacket, you might wanna bring that along with you to children in worship or to second hour because it's a little chillier over there. Now, as we begin our time of worship, I invite you to turn in your red hymnals to number 817, and we'll sing the chorus of Taste and See.
invite you to rise in body or spirit as God calls us to worship. Let us begin this day by rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us. Let us be glad. The day before us is uncertain. We know not what we will encounter on our way. Wherever we go, we go forth as people of the living God. We go forth to touch the lives of all with Christ's healing touch. Let us begin this day with rejoicing. Let us worship our God together. Let us continue to worship our God, singing 521 in our red hymnal, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and will come again, and all God's people said, amen. amen. I invite you to be seated. The Lord has done great things for us, and yet we know that too often we have failed to respond to God's love by living well as God's people but trusting in God's steadfast love. Let us now confess our sins together. God of salvation, you have done great things for us. In Christ, you have lifted us out of the wasteland of sin and brought us into your reign. And yet, though we could offer you endless things, we are so often resentful. Though our hearts could be filled with gratitude, we are so often upset about what we lack. Though we could offer you appreciation, we so often complain. Forgive us, God. Though we have sown our days with bitterness and tears, may we reap with shouts of rejoicing. May our mouths be filled with laughter and our tongues be filled with the joy of your salvation. Amen. 
people of God, the Lord has done great things for us. God hears, forgives, and saves. The Lord has reconciled us to God and to one another. Let us rejoice. And having been reconciled, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace of Christ together in a safe and physically distant way. <laughs>
Our first reading this morning comes to us from the book of Jeremiah. We'll read chapter 31, verses 7 through 9. We can find that on page 641 in our sanctuary Bibles. Listen for the word of God. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come And with consolations, I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And our second reading is Psalm 126. I will sing a a refrain throughout the reading of this psalm. Uh, The words are not in your bulletin, so I invite you to listen carefully as I read them now. The Lord is our refuge, the Most High, our dwelling place. And we'll sing that twice as we get started here. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been hiking on a trail or driving on a road through a forest and come upon a stand of dead trees and wondered, what's the story here? 
maybe fire swept through or water levels rose or disease spread unchecked. Something killed off that entire stand of trees. All that remains standing are the trunks, stripped of bark and blanched by the sun. They stand as silent sentinels, mournfully guarding a land devastated by death. I read that one drought ago, the southwest of the U.S. experienced a massive die-off of centuries-old pinyon trees. Now, pinyon trees are slow-growing, water-efficient trees that once covered the hills of northern New Mexico with their green needles held up in the air. Pinyon trees promote soil health by adding nutrients and provide nuts for animals and people alike. But a many years long drought weakened these trees and they became susceptible to bark beetles. Thousands and thousands of trees died. The green landscape turned ghostly gray. Growth and good times can end. Fortunes can be lost. A land of beauty and tranquility can encounter devastation. Psalm 126 begins with the inverse of that idea by recalling the joy of unexpected restoration. We don't know with certainty the story behind this psalm, but it's clear something unambiguously good has happened. God has brought deliverance on a grand scale. It's as if a stand of dead trees has been brought back to life. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. The magnitude of the joy evoked in the first half of this psalm leads many to think it is recalling the end of the Babylonian exile, the time when the people of Judah returned to the promised land. There's no bigger restoration in the Hebrew scriptures. The exile had been complete devastation the end of a dream. The people of Judah were broken. They didn't have the strength to rise up and throw an empire off. But the Persians did. The Persians rose up, conquered the Babylonians, and then they allowed God's people to return home. Being restored to the land had seemed impossible. But through the Persians, the Hebrew people saw God making their dream come true. And so there was joy and laughter and boasting about the great things God has done. But the second half of this psalm takes a sharp turn. The restoration in the past was joyful, but it's only a memory now. In the present, the water has stopped flowing. The trees have stopped growing. The people live in a state of despair once again. Now, if this psalm is about the exile, we have some insight into what this disappointment is about. The return from the exile is joyous, but the reality of living in the land was a daily struggle. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah chronicle the difficulty of rebuilding the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. The neighbors jeered and resisted them. Their community structure was in tatters. When the foundations of the temple were finally put back in place, the old people wept because their work paled in comparison to the splendor of Solomon's temple. The people of Judah were back in the land but they had not returned to the glory days of David and Solomon's reign. In their disappointment, they cried out for God to restore them again. But how could they hope that things would get any better? It's very hard for us to believe that the way things are right now can change. And I'm not just talking about major changes to the way we live, I'm even talking about changes we know will happen. In the heat of summer, I don't know about you, but I have trouble believing that one day soon, it will be so cold it will hurt. In the winter, we have difficulty believing that it will get so hot and humid, we'll break a sweat just going out to get the mail. 
The NPR show Hidden Brain recently explored the chasm we struggle to cross between the state we are in and any other state of being. Hidden Brain's host, Shankar Vedantam, interviewed Carnegie Mellon professor George Lowenstein. A Lowenstein is a runner, and he often runs up the huge hills in his town. Now, these hills are miserably big, even for an accomplished runner. Now, Lowenstein noticed that on the way up to the peak of the hill, all he could think of was the pain. The pain was endless. The idea of relief was inconceivable. But the moment he crested the hill, the pain faded so quickly that in his memory, it hadn't been so bad. A few days later, he would lace up his shoes and run up that hill again. Alonstein realized that when we're not in pain or cold, or experiencing a powerful emotion like anger or fear, it's very difficult to imagine ourselves in that situation. Now, emotions completely transform us as people. When we're in one emotional state, we are effectively different people than when we're in a different emotional state. Lowenstein identified this empathy gap we can have within ourselves and it's a gap that extends to our understanding of others. If a friend tells us they are feeling depressed, we might say, oh, I feel really sorry for you. But if we aren't depressed ourselves, it's actually very hard for us to imagine what they're going through. Now, if there's a gap when we try to imagine ourselves in a different emotional state, if there is a chasm when we try to imagine what another person is experiencing, then there is an abyss when we try to imagine a future for a whole people different from how it is right now. The best orders, like Martin Luther King Jr., can pierce our imagination with a glimpse of what is possible by describing their dream, but in the present, it's incredibly hard for us to believe that the future can actually be different. Now, I've experienced this in my own life. Growing up, I had an uncle who was gay, but I didn't know he was gay. I knew he existed somewhere out there in California, but it was the 1980s. My parents and grandparents decided to keep the knowledge of my uncle's sexual orientation hidden from me and eventually from my brothers. This uncle was effectively cut off from family gatherings, at least if he wanted to bring his partner. Now, I didn't find out about his sexual orientation or his partner until I was in seminary in 2005, around the time of the Norm Cansfield trial at General Synod. Well, Sarah and I went out to visit my uncles in 2006, and we were restored to one another. It was a great trip but the cutoff in the rest of my family remained. I remember beginning to pray for reconciliation in my family and having no real hope for that reconciliation. I didn't believe it was possible. I didn't believe the people involved would change or that the situation could move forward. I thought we were stuck in a disappointing present. The people addressed in Psalm 126 are stuck in a disappointing present. But curiously, the psalm doesn't point to a vision of a different future. Instead, the psalm turns to the past. The psalmist remembers God's saving work in history and points to the story of how God has restored God's people before. The psalmist tells the family story. One of the best parts of gathering with family is the joy that can come when we share family stories. Often these stories are about disasters survived and mistakes overcome. My family tells stories of a bee sting at a college football game. My brother falling off a wagon onto a stone pile head first. The transgression of sneaking a dog into the house high school pranks done under the cover of darkness, 
illnesses endured, seasons of want overcome, and the time we won second place in the Alto Fair parade, but deserved first. Family stories elicit tears and laughter and joy. Ultimately, they are a celebration of our deliverance to this current day. Now, Psalm 126 tells the family story of God's people. It gives people disappointed in the present a concrete reminder of God's work in the past. And the memory of God's deliverance plants a seed of hope in the present for a future that will be different. The psalm doesn't promise a return to former glory. It's not wishful thinking about making Israel great again. No, the psalm speaks of loss and transformation. The future will be different, but it will be good. God provides growth that begins out of sight underground. Seeds sown in tears will be harvested with shouts of joy. Well, the previous drought in New Mexico eventually ended. The rains returned. The pinion trees were still dead, their trunks still blanched white. But within days of the rains returning, fields of wildflowers sprang up. Every patch of ground was covered with yellow cow daisies, purple asters, and other flowers that hadn't been seen in centuries. The needles of the dead pinion trees provided mulch and nutrients for these long dormant seeds. Out of death and disappointment, new life arose. The glory of the past is gone. It never comes back. But the memory of the past can give hope in the midst of a disappointing present. Psalm 126 reminds us that we are part of a much larger story. We are more than the moment we are stuck in. We can trust that God will do great things in the future because God has done great things in the past. Now, it's always going to feel like we are stuck in the moment we're in. Right? Childhood seems to last forever. The pandemic seems to last forever. Depression seems to last forever. But when we remember God's deliverance in the past, a ray of light encourages us to continue on in the present. We don't know the challenges waiting for us tomorrow, but we have hope for the future because God has been good in the past. To my amazement, there has been movement and change in my family. The wall between my uncles and parents has been broken down. Maybe it was getting older, maybe it was a changing culture, maybe it was the acceptance of my generation, but the cutoff in my family is done. Now, there is still not full reconciliation, but the secret is out. Everyone can share the same space, and we all worked together last month to move my grandmother to a new home. It's a future I didn't believe was possible. But thanks be to God, I now have a story of God's restorative work in my life, a story of God getting people unstuck. Now, sharing the stories of God's deliverance is important because these stories help us trust God in the midst of the disappointing present. The, they are uh, the seeds of hope for a surprisingly good future. And these stories remind us of whose we are. I wonder what story of God's deliverance helps you get unstuck from the present? What helps you remember that your life is bigger than this moment, that you belong to a much larger family and a much larger story? I hope you share a story of God's deliverance around the table today with friends or family. It's okay if it's a story filled with agony, and it's okay if it's a story filled with ecstasy, because at the center of all our stories is Christ Jesus. And Jesus is the one who sowed in tears and reaped in joy. Jesus knows the pain of death 
and the laughter of resurrection. Jesus embodies the story of God's deliverance and invites us to do likewise. So may we remember God's deliverance in the past. May we trust God's power to transform the future. And may we live with hope right now here in the present. Let's pray. We thank you, good God, for your word, which comes to us over centuries and centuries of time, inspired by your spirit, brought forth to us today to remind us of who you are, of whose we are, and of the work you continue to do in this world and in our lives. Help us to go forward with a measure of confidence that you are with us now and that you are always at work, often in ways we cannot see. But we look forward to the day when we can look back to this time right now and see how your hand was at work. And we can tell another story of your faithfulness throughout our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response is number 55 in our red books. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing when God first brought us back. I invite you to be seated. In just a moment, when all things are ready, we'll invite you to come forward to receive the communion elements. You can come forward starting in the front rows, making our way toward the back through the center aisles. 
In the front, you'll receive an individual portion of juice with a wafer on the top. If you need a gluten-free one, just ask. We can give those to you. Then you can take that, return to your seats by the side aisles, and then in your seat, partake of God's good feast for us. If you need to remain in your seat, just raise a hand, and a server will bring the elements to you there. Now let us pray together. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up, up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give our, our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is right to praise you, O God, ruler of all creation. In your love, you shaped us from the earth and formed us as your people. When we ran away from you, you did not abandon us but came to meet us in your son, Jesus Christ. You made your home among us and embraced us as your children, welcoming us to sit and eat with you. Now gathered together with those who worship you in every time and place, we find our home in you and join in the eternal hymn of praise. blessing. You bring us home and provide us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. At this table, we become one family through Christ, who on the same night in which he gave himself for us, took bread, gave thanks to you, and broke the bread. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, Christ took the cup. And gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Together, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. God, send down your spirit upon us and welcome us home once again, that we may know ourselves to be your children and siblings with one another in Christ. May this bread sustain us and this cup strengthen us as we follow you, until at last you bring us home and reign on earth as in heaven. Even so, come Lord Jesus. the bread of life given for us. Let, Let all who hunger come and eat. Here's the fruit of the vine poured out for us. Let, Let all who thirst come and drink. These are the gifts of God for the, the people, people of God. God. Let us come for all things are now ready.
As we come in prayer this morning, I have an update about Robert Padilla, who is having a bone marrow transplant on Tuesday. His donation from his donor uh, happened earlier this past week, and it was less than ideal. They're still going ahead with the transplant on Tuesday, but it will mean a longer and more difficult recovery. So please keep Robert and his wife, Vicki, in your prayers this week. Throughout our prayer this morning, I will say, Lord, hear our prayer, and you're invited to respond, and in your love, answer. Let's pray together. Eternal God, you have been our resting place throughout the ages. Generations come and pass away, but you abide forever. You bring us comfort in our trials, clarity, in our confusion, peace in the midst of conflict, and hope for eternal life. Hear us now as we pray for your church and the needs of your world. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the riches of this day for earnings sufficient to support our needs, for the abundance of a harvest, for technology and education. Show us always how to better recognize your gifts and how to shape them into benefits for the common good. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. Grant wisdom, O oh God, to all who lead the nations and hold public office. Especially we pray for our mayor, Rosalind, our governor, Gretchen, and our president, Joseph. Give all those who lead the humility to speak the truth in love and to act for the good of all the people they serve. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. We pray, O oh God, for peace in every land, for refugees from violence and need, for medical staff in war-torn places, for parents caring for children, for those who participate in violence, and for diplomats working with governments around the world. Bring peace to every people, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for those in any kind of want. Feed the hungry, sustain the weary, shelter the homeless, challenge the complacent, love the brokenhearted, and heal the sick. We pray especially today for Robert. May his body accept this transplant, and may the healthy cells he receives do powerful work to bring healing to his body. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. 
We pray, O oh God, for your church, especially for our own Reformed Church in America. We give you thanks for a general synod that was marked by unity, listening, and love. We ask for your forgiveness for the aspects of synod that failed to express your expansive love for all people. And we pray that as we move forward, sometimes together, sometimes apart, that our churches will be filled with your spirit and known by your fruit. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Invite you now to rise in body or spirit for our song of sending. It's number 430 in our red hymnals. You are mine. you reached my 
invite you to lift your arms in unity, to express our unity in Christ, and to know that as we go from this place, we have heard God's story. So we go forward with faith, hope, and love, and we go with God's blessing. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.